everybody and welcome back. For today's video, I'm going to be talking all about EENT or ears, eyes, nose, and throat. There is a lot to go over, but I do feel like this topic is relatively straightforward as a lot of it's very familiar as we've all taken care of patients with, with at least some of these health complaints. So I think that this should be a pretty easy um, discussion. I will focus on diagnosis, pharmacological treatment, follow-up, and warning signs to look out for when managing these patients. And of course, it's all geared towards prepping you for the nurse practitioner board's exam. At the end of the video, as always, I did include a dump sheet to help supplement your studies. Don't forget to leave me any questions or comments that you might have, and please subscribe to this channel if you found it helpful in your studying. All right, guys, on to EENT. All right, so first I'll actually be discussing eyes as I personally did have a few questions on my board's exam um, regarding eyes. And there seems like there's a few more topics to discuss in this category, so we'll just do eyes first. So first up is the subconjunctival hemorrhage. And there's a picture there on the right. I feel like we've all seen this, um, where somebody you know is coughing really hard and they're on or, or on or not on blood thinners. But we have all the little blood vessels in our eyeballs that can break, and that's exactly what this is. So it's bright red blood, sharply demarcated area of the eyeball, surrounded by normal conjunctiva and a norm or a normal eyeball. So it's just that area that's affected. Everything else is um, normal. There's no issues. Blood is trapped between the sclera and the conjunctiva and a coagulation therapy, hypertension, diabetes, all of those increase the risk of having this occur. It requires no treatment and the blood actually reabsorbs in 10 to 14 days. So if our patients are coming in with this, we just reassure them. Conjuncti um, conjunctivitis, this is inflammation of the conjunctiva. It's typically benign or self-limiting, and I have a picture um, on the right-hand side there. So it, the, it says the second eye typically becomes involved 24 to 48 hours after the first eye is affected. It can be infectious, but it also can be allergic in nature. The most common um, organism causing for a, a viral conjunctivitis is adenovirus. Symptoms of conjunctivitis include itchy red eyes, clear purulent discharge, um, does not affect vision. This is a clinical diagnosis and it's made with um, exclusion of other eye issues. It can be bacterial or it can be viral, but either way, it's extremely contagious. And obviously antibiotics, we want to reserve those for when it is a bacterial infection, specifically those that wear contact lenses. They are going to be at a much higher risk of having bacterial infection. And anyone that's wearing contact lenses, we're always going to be treating them with antibiotics. So blepharitis, um, there's another picture there. This is located um, on the eyelid itself. And there's redness, irritation, gritty sensation, a big um, identifying factor for this one is the crusting, the, red, the flakiness on the eyelash and the lid margin. So this, again, is a clinical diagnosis. Treatment is going to be good, hi uh, good hygiene, warm compresses, and then topical antibiotics can be used, and that's uh, bacitracin, erythromycin are examples. And then also these patients, they might require artificial tears um, for dry eye. So the hordeolum or a sty. Uh, so this is... So hordeolum and chalazion, sometimes these can get mixed up and I have a way that I remember it and I've never had an issue since. So hordeolum or sty, this is painful. This is the abscess of a hair follicle, a sebaceous gland, and it's on the eyelid. And with this, the treatment is warm compresses three to even five times a day to allow that to begin to drain. And so they'll have the compresses for five to 10 minutes on the sty. And then we'll want to educate our patients that they should avoid Eye makeup, definitely no eye makeup while they're healing. And then how I remember this is hordeolum hurts, horrible, styes suck. <laughs> In my mind, this is the things that I did to remember that that is painful. Styes suck is usually how I would say. Um, but also you could think like hordeolum hurts. Chalazion is chill. So I did, I, I reminded myself that chalazion is chill. This is non-tender and that's a big way that you'll differentiate between a sty and a chalazion is that, again, like I said, the chalazion is non-tender bump on the eyelid. It's chronic inflammation of the meibomian gland and treatment, again, is going to be warm compresses. So at least you know that you can't go wrong with the warm compresses. <laughs> 
All right, so what if our patients come in complaining of a possible foreign body or a scratch on their eye? What are the steps that we should take to examine them? And this is a really easy methodical approach. The first step is always going to be to get a visual acuity on these patients. That's number one. And then we'll go ahead and examine. We should use magnification and light to examine the eye and making sure that we're looking at it from all angles, so straight on, but also from the side as well, as examining the eyeball from the side will give you a better angle to see if there's anything actually impaling the eyeball. And then we'll use our fluorescein stain, and that's to check for any damage to the cornea, as that stain will highlight if there is an abrasion or a scratch there. And then last step is do not forget to revert the eyelid, and there's a picture for you there. So it takes a little bit of skill. <laughs> Um, so treatment is ophthalmic antibiotics, and you want to treat against pseudomonas, specifically if the patient has an abrasion and also wears contact lenses, as this is usually the causative agent. For example, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, gentamicin, those are options for the antibiotics. And then also you will want to update their tetanus if it's indicated. And then if there is a foreign body seen, then we want to refer these patients. Macular degeneration, this is the most common cause of blindness in adults, and the complaint is that they'll come in complaining of is loss of central vision. So obviously this is going to greatly impact the quality of their life. The risk increases with age, and smoking is actually the largest modifiable risk factor. So a good education point for our patients to avoid smoking, as this has been linked to worsening of macular degeneration. And then for these pa patients, obviously, we're referring them. Cataracts is opacity of the lens. And for this, the changes in vision are gradual, slow, and painless. They might complain of things like sensitivity to glare, having difficulty seeing, driving at night, halos around lights, a little bit of blurred vision. All of these can be complaints with cataracts. And with these patients as well, we will refer them. For open angle glaucoma, I'm pretty sure you'll have a question about this. So this is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in the world. Um, this is due to optic neuropathy and its progressive peripheral vision loss, followed then by central vision loss. And we all have kind of attribute this to increased ocular pressure, which does generally occur with uh, glaucoma. And so I included for you there the normal um, pressure reading with the tonometer, tonometer, <laughs> and it's 8 to uh, 21, and I included that for you there. Also, for these patients, they'll have a greater than 50% cup to disc ratio, so you might actually see, um, if you're like skilled, I'm still working on my eye exam, but cupping is uh, another key thing to look for with glaucoma. So risk factors, this includes African-American race, a family history of glaucoma, and then obviously an increased intraocular pressure is a, a risk for glaucoma as well. So a few more things to discuss about the eyes. So there is something called the pinguecula. This is a yellowish raised growth on the conjunctiva next to the cornea, and there is a picture for you. And then there is the pterygium, which is a yellow triangular thickening of the conjunctiva that extends across the cornea surface on the nasal side. So there's a picture for you there. So a big difference is this is extending across the cornea surface. The way I remembered it, though, was there's a T in pterygium and uh, the triangular thickening T. So that helped me differentiate those. A retinoblastoma, this is a congenital tumor of the retina, and it's rarely bilateral. It's usually just one eyeball that is affected, and it grows with uh, the child. So the pupil may appear white, and it might actually be first noticed in pictures, where instead of seeing a red eye or a red glare that you would usually see in pictures, one of the eyes is white. And there's a picture, and obviously we're referring these patients. I find myself always looking for this in pictures of children now. It kind of haunts me, but something to look for. So there's the Snellen chart or the Ishihara chart. I'm um, just important for you to know. So we all know the Snellen chart. That is where you're checking 
uh, your visual acuity, your central distant vision. And an ex so I and include an example in case you ever get them confused. So for example, 2060 vision. 20, the first 20 never changes, and this is saying distance. So the patient has to be 20 feet away from an object to see what somebody with perfect vision can see at 60 feet away. So they have to be so much closer. So I hope that makes sense. So they have to be at 20 feet from the object, whereas somebody can see what they can see from 60 feet. So 20, 60. So it's, you know, it's not great, obviously. And then the Ishikahara chart is screening for color blindness. And there's a picture for you there. And if they're able to differentiate and pick out the numbers in there, then they're able, able to um, see both colors, obviously, or see a variety of colors. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then sleeping with contact lenses. This is a really important point. So it can result in a bacterial infection or lens keratitis and symptoms that we'll look for, eye pain, erythema, excessive amount of tearing, possible corneal lesions. We want to culture this eye discharge and we're going to do topical antibiotics for these patients as well. And just really important to educate that if they wear contacts to not wear them at night. All right, so leaving eyes and on to ears. First up, acute otitis externa, and this is also referred to as swimmer's ear. And this is, of course, more common in those warm and humid seasons because that's when people are out swimming. Um, symptoms include external ot otagia, discharge, possible hearing loss if there is a sufficient pus present. And treatment is listed for you there. Important to note that if the tympanic membrane cannot be confirmed whether or not it's intact, then we want to avoid ototoxic medications like neomycin, gentamicin, tobramycin, all of those are gonna be ototoxic. Ofloxacin is a safe option. And then we wanna educate our patients to keep their ear out of water during their treatment. So acute otitis media is a middle ear infection and patient is going to complain of symptoms like otalgia, um, fever, lots of pain, you'll see a bulging of a tympanic membrane, marked erythema. This is a clinical diagnosis and it's made with the bulging tympanic membrane, signs of acute inflammation, and then middle ear effusion. Treatment is going to be amoxicillin and that's 90 mg per kg per day for 5 to 7 days if they're 2 and older. If they're less than 2 years old, then it's recommended they have antibiotics for 10 days. And this is the first line treatment if the patient has had no history of recurrent, recurrent acute otitis media and no risk of antibiotic resistance. And then um, for those patients that fall into that category of recurrent AOM and then antibiotic resistance is a concern, something like Augmentin or Ceftriaxone is going to be a better option for those patients. Also, if the patient experiences uh, treatment failure with amoxicillin, then we can try something like amoxicillin with clavulanate or ceftriaxone. And then acetaminophen and ibuprofen for pain management. Oh, and then also if the patient has a penicillin allergy, a true penicillin allergy, then we can use macrolide as a backup. A backup. So azithromycin, clarithromycin, uh, bolus myringitis, this is severe acute otitis media, and this presents with painful blisters on an erythematous tympanic membrane. If you look up the pictures, it looks brutal. They can experience hearing loss as well um, and a low-grade fever. And then last point here that I included on this slide is risk factors for hearing loss in infancy. And there's a mnemonic that makes it super easy to remember because it's HEARS. H for hyperbilirubinemia, E for ear infection frequency, A for low APGAR scores, R for rubella exposure, and S for seizures. And all of those are contributing factors that can increase the risk of hearing loss in infancy. So a few more important points in regards to ears. So conductive hearing loss versus sensorineural hearing loss. It's important that you understand the difference between these for your boards. So conductive hearing loss, this occurs when sound waves are blocked. So an example is a cerumen impaction or earwax or fluid. These are blocking the sound waves. Conductive cerumen, that I kind of just reminded, uh, remembered it that way. That is a perfect example of conductive hearing loss. And examples of tests that we can do are the Rhine and the Weber. So the Rhine test, it will result in bone conduction greater than air conduction if the patient has conductive hearing loss. And then the, Web te the Weber test, 
A normal result is if there's no lateralization, so sound vibrations are going to be heard equally on both sides um, when the tuning fork is there, placed at the midline there at the forehead. And then for if there is damage or if there's an affected ear, then vibrations or sounds are going to be quieter on that bad or affected side. So sensio-neural, this is much more serious. This is one we definitely need to refer. Conductive hearing loss we can usually take we can manage um, in primary care outpatient. Sensio-neural, these need to be referred to ENT. And this is when hearing loss actually occurs within the ear's inner structures. For example, like the cochlea. Oh gosh, presbycusis, I hope I said that correctly. But a really important term to know, it's progressive symmetric hearing loss over the years in the elderly. And the reason that this is so important for us to know is that the decline in their hearing actually relates and can um, worsen cognitive function. So it can actually cause a loss of cognitive function in our patients and the elderly when they can't hear as well. So examples of sensio-neural hearing loss is going to be something like Meniere's disease. And like I said, again, we are referring these patients. We don't manage them. We just want to pick up on it. So Meniere's disease, symptoms of this are going to be vertigo, tinnitus, and hearing loss. But Vertigo that lasts 20 minutes to 12 hours. That is insane. That is a really long time. That's a huge red flag. We refer them. For BPPV or benign proximal positional vertigo, so this is a very common cause of vertigo. It's recurrent episodes that last one minute or less. Compare that to the 20 minutes to 12 hours. So it's generally provoke, provoked by specific types of head movements. And the way that we diagnose this is really easy. It's a, a maneuver that we do in the office. It's called the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver. And there's a picture up there in the right-hand corner for you. And what this does is this actually provokes nystagmus when we do this with our patients if they're having BPPV. And um, for treatment for this is just another maneuver that we can educate them on and show them how to do. And this is called the Epley Maneuver. And this is a really great way also to help um, determine and differentiate between Meniere's and BPPV if their symptoms improve with the Dix are the Epley maneuver, and if we are able to elicit nystagmus with the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, then we know that this indicates BPPV. And if it doesn't, if things don't improve, then we are going to be concerned with Meniere's disease. And like I said again, we're referring those patients. All right, out of ears and on to nose. So there's a couple things here important to know. First, being acute and back and or bacterial sinusitis. So this is inflammation of the sinus cavity. More often than not, it's viral, not bacterial. Symptoms um, include headache, face pain, it can be jaw pain, teeth pain, and it usually increases in intensity when the patient bends over. Also, they might complain of ear pain or a sore throat. When we start con being concerned that it's bacterial is if they are going seven days without any improvement. After one full week of these symptoms and they're not improving or they're worsening, then we start really considering that this is bacterial and it's appropriate to treat with antibiotics. So for bacterial sinusitis, the initial treatment is gonna be amoxicillin and that's five to seven days or amoxicillin clavulanate is also listed as first line. So neither one's wrong. Other treatment options include doxycycline, third generation cephalosporin or clindamycin. And then things to consider again are going to be if they've had recent antibiotics, if they're unresponsive to treatment, then amoxicillin clavulanate or a third generation cephalosporin are going to be more appropriate. Allergic rhinitis, so symptoms of this include sneezing, rhinorrhea, puritis of the face, lots of itching, post-nasal drip, fatigue, cough, itchy, itchy. And there is something called the allergic salute. And this is transverse nasal crease that occurs from that itch right there. That picture shows you of that, that um, common itch that they do. And that is a sign of allergic rhinitis. First line treatment for these patients is topical nasal steroid. For example, flut fluticasone. And they can actually get these over the counter. And then if these aren't improving, if symptoms aren't improving, then we can go ahead and add an antihistamine. But first line is the topical nasal steroids. If they're not having any improvement with treatment, then we refer these patients to an allergist. And then the last point here is epistaxis. Most of our, um, most patients' epistaxis actually occurs at something called the 
Castle Black's plexus, which is the anterior inferior area of the nasal septum. Lots of um, vessels there. And so if they are experiencing the epistaxis, then we have them bend at the waist, and that minimizes the risk of aspiration and swallowing uh, blood. And then we have them pinch just below that nasal bridge for about five to 10 minutes, and hopefully that will stop the bleeding. And important to note too, is that sometimes frequent nosebleeds can actually indicate something more serious is going on, like cancer of the nasal cavity. All right, so on to throat. First up is pharyngitis. I'm sure we've all taken care of patients with this. The most common bacterial cause for pharyngitis is gonna be group A strep. And symptoms of this include fever, a sudden onset of sore throat, tonsillar exudates, and then tender lymph nodes. Diagnosis is a couple things. We have a rapid or we can do cultures. If they do have this, then we want to treat with antibiotics. And the first line treatment is going to be penicillin times 10 days. Pen times 10, pen times 10 for pharyngitis. And then there's an alternative, which is azithromycin. Complications of strep, there are, are some very serious complications, which is why we want to be so on top of treating these patients. Complications include otitis media, meningitis, rheumatic fever, so really serious stuff. Uh, mononucleosis, this is important because strep and mono often go hand in hand and occur actually um, simultaneously. So symptoms of this include fever, fatigue, pharyngitis, and lymphadenopathy. That are, those are the classic symptoms for that. Diagnosis, there's a couple different tests. The monospot, this can be falsely negative early on in an infection. And the more accurate test is the viral capsid antigen, which shows you the IgM or the IgG. So we know IgM um, is for acute illness. I was told in my clinical IgM, just imagine the M as the A, like the points. And I, I don't know, it stuck with me and like the G for chronic. Even, I don't know, for some reason that worked for me. Also, you can think IgM for the minute you get infected. But IgM is acute illness, IgG. That usually occurs 6 to 12 weeks after the onset of symptoms was when the IgG would be positive. And then also for these patients, a CBC will show atypical lymphocytosis in 75% of patients, so majority of patients. These patients for follow-up and managing them is that 50% of patients with mononucleosis have splenomegaly. Or, so that's huge. It's a really big rupture risk. So they need three to four weeks minimum of no contact sports. And we want to confirm if they did have splenomegaly, we want to confirm that it's resolved with an ultrasound before saying that they are safe to go back to sports. And then last up here is the epiglottis. The common organism for this is going to be group A strep again. This requires antibiotics, but this requires closer monitoring than we can do outpatient. And that's because it can progress to airway obstruction. And if you look at the picture there and you um, locate the epiglottis, you can see why inflammation of that really quickly can block off the airway. So symptoms of airway obstruction um, that we want to be on the lookout for, strider, drooling, respiratory distress, anxiety. If we're seeing these things, they need to get to the ER and not by car, but we're calling an ambulance. So um, huge there as well. And you might see something on your boards about that. All right, so this means that I have reached the end of my discussion. As always, here is the dump sheet to help supplement your studies. It's completely dedicated to EENT, covers all those points that you need to know for your board's exam and very helpful for your entry into practice. As always, leave me any que uh, questions or comments. And if you have a topic that you'd like me to discuss, then leave that down there for me as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel if it's helped you in your studying and share it with anyone else that you think might benefit from it as well. I do appreciate your guys' support. And as always, I hope you guys have the best weekend coming up. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.